Sekweani, Tenzi, hello and good afternoon, everyone. I would like to start by welcoming you to our first lecture in the 2021 Indigenous Women Speaker Series on Decolonization and Health. We will begin today with a virtual territorial acknowledgement. As this meeting is virtual and we are all not we are not all gathered in the same space, I recognize that this land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you are currently on. We ask that if this that if this is the case, that you take on the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are on and its current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of our institution. We acknowledge our presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tecoronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Metis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which is an agreement to peacefully care and share for our Great Lakes region. This land acknowledgement is the beginning of responsibilities incumbent upon York University administrators, faculty, and students. The Center for Feminist uh, Researchers Indigenous Women Speaker Series, now in its fifth year, is part of this responsibility for making space in the academy for Indigenous women's and Indigenous feminist voices. The Center for Feminist Research is therefore pleased to co-organize today's talk following the inaugural CFR lectures, which have featured, among others, Cree-speaking Métis uh, feminist poet Emma LaRock, Professors Deborah McGregor, Karen Ricolet, and Sharon Suzak, Professor Joyce Green, and Sharon McIver. Today, we are very pleased to have as our guest, Professor Mishona Goman, who will be speaking about mapping urban communities of care in cartographic art practices. My name is Elaine Coburn. I am a guest on Indigenous lands and I am the director of the Center for Feminist Research at York University today. I'm very pleased to introduce my co-organizer for this event, Professor Sean Hillier, uh, Hillier, who is a Mi'kmaq scholar from the Kualapu First Nation, who resides in the School of Health Policy Management and serves as the special advisor to the Dean of Health on Indigenous Research and as chair of the Indigenous Council at York University. So this lecture series continues to mark an important historical moment for the School of Health Policy and Management, the Faculty of Health, and York University more broadly in its demonstration of the commitment to coming together with prominent Indigenous scholars to listen and to learn. All of this process may, uh, through this process, may we begin to understand the impact of colonization on the spaces and places in which we study, in which we live, and where we work. We would like to thank the co-sponsors for this event, the Center for Feminist Research, the new Center for Indigenous Knowledges and Languages, and the Faculty of Health, as well as the Provost of York University through the Indigenous Teaching and Learning Fund. So the format for today's event will be a lecture by Professor Goman uh, of about 45 minutes, followed by about 30 minutes or so of moderated questions and answers. So during the lecture, please feel free to submit any questions that you have using the Q&A function. Elaine and I will be monitoring this throughout the event, and we'll pose these questions uh, at the end of the talk. So Dr. Goman, uh, Tonawanda Band of Seneca, is an Associate Professor of Gender Studies. She is the previous Chair of American Indian Studies Interdepartmental Program and the Associate Director of American Indian Studies Research Center at the University of California, Los Angeles. She received her doctorate from Stanford, from Stanford University's Modern Thought and Literature and was the UC Presidential Postdoctoral Fellow at Berkeley. Her research involves thinking through uh, colonialism, geography, and literature in ways that generate anti-colonial tools in the struggle for social justice. Her book, Mark My Words, Native Women Mapping Our Nations with the University of Minnesota Press in 2013 was honored at the American Association for Geographic Perspectives on Women and a finalist for Best First Book from the Native American and Indigenous Studies Association. Professor Goman's work has been published in a wide range of peer-reviewed journals, including the American Quarterly, Critical Ethnic Studies, Settler Colonial Studies, Wikizo Sa, the International Journal of Critical Indigenous Studies, Frontiers, a journal of women's studies, Transmotion, and American Indian Cultures and Research Journal. Her contributions span the scholarly and artistic on themes from visual geographies to story maps, settler colonialism to decolonization, always honoring the contributions of Indigenous women in creating knowledges in and outside of the academy. And with that, I'm very pleased to welcome Professor Goman to begin today's talk mapping urban communities of care in, cartog in cartographic art practices. Welcome, Professor Goman. 
hello, uh, everyone. Um, uh, Nyawe Sikan, I'm very happy to be here. I want to thank everyone for their assistance and all the organizers and the staff for bringing this uh, talk together. Uh, I understand that, that there was a time shift and a time change so that we could make sure that none of the Zoom bombing happens. I've had that happen to me recently as well. And it was well in the beginning of the pandemic and it's horrifying. Um, and it also speaks to why I'm talking about communities of care and what that means as anti-colonial practices today. Uh, in that vein, I'm a guest on, I'm an indigenous guest on Tomva land. Uh, you can see a map, an artistic rendering of the, the map of uh, Los Angeles basin area behind me in Tavangar, which I'll be talking about shortly here. So, Thank you, Nyawe, to everybody. And I am going to start and give my talk. I'm gonna share my screen with you all. My last talk, I forgot to share the screen. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, are we all set? Yeah, everyone can see. I'm hoping that you all can see it, so, okay. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, so, Indians are the singing remnants uh, or graffiti in the words of Leanne Simpson. The forms this graffiti takes are as numerous as our nations, abundant as our ancestors who loved, lived and passed down knowledge of our lands and histories. You are the result of the love of thousands, writes Linda Hogan, who beseeches us to listen to the environment around us, to use all our senses and understanding the capacity for growth we have in relation to land. Deborah Miranda Coastal Esalon in Chumash reminds us that we are also the result of violent histories in her tribal memoir, Bad Indians. This book relishes in the tale of her ancestors who resist and act out in order to survive, whose, whose um, legislated criminality is part of that survival. This harm and genocide in a settler mapping of worlds too must be attuned to in our surroundings and in quote, our bodies that are bridges over what our descendants cross spanning unimaginable landscapes of loss. Cartographic mapping through the visual has been part and parcel of the erasure of California and Indians, relegated to the small, contained, and past temporal spaces of a romanticized mission, itself a space of racialization and a cartography put in place throughout California. This paper centers the Indian Collective's work in photography of Chimawavy photographer Cara Romero's project Tomva Land, as well as the work of Gabrielino Tomva artist Mercedes Dorme. I highly encourage you all to take a look online at Mercedes Dorme's uh, larger work as well. The setting of these projects is in the sprawling landscape of Los Angeles, or the homelands of the Gabrielino Tomva people who call it Tovangar. I will examine the anti-colonial aesthetics and care practices mapped out in the work rather than present any idea of a true indigenous map or alternative map or a counter map. Rather at times these are deeply indigenous maps putting forth new landscapes and um, visions of indigenous futurity. Mapping a history of the landscape by, uh, by creating a new narrative or a true narrative is not enough. As Maori scholar Linda Twehi Smith states, we believe that history is also about justice, that understanding history will enlighten our decisions about the future. Wrong. History is also about power. In fact, history is mostly about power. A thousand accounts of the truth will not alter the fact that indigenous people are still marginal and do not possess the power to transform history into justice. The same can be said for acts of mapping. Presenting a map is not necessarily going to undo the power dynamics at play. So how can we begin to develop outside of cartographic practices that are just alter alternative uh, cartographic viewpoints? How can we instead use maps as process and as praxis? 
The Gabrielino Tanva, who comprise an estimated 2,300 people, do not possess the population power and cannot use the form of voting or democracy to make the change that is needed just by telling the, their truth. Across California, people are well aware of the raw deal, the embezzlement, the genocide, and the so-called lost treaties. People are well aware that the mission itself was a place of imprisonment for California Indians. In fact, under Eisenhower, recompense was paid out in small amounts to Tomba families of the dispossessed. Rather, uh, and that was $633 to each individual Gabrielino Tomba for land in California. And we could think about what that means in Los Angeles. Rather to continue with the words of Linda Tuehi Smith, it is also about reconciling and reprioritizing what is really important about the past with what is important about the present. What Cara Romero and the Indian Collective made up of numerous tribal leaders, scholars, and other artists and those in, that occupy all those categories, what they did was to relay and prioritize how they wanted to be seen in their homelands. These billboards invite us in in a gift of sharing or what tribal cultural leader Craig Torres related to me as the spirit of Maha, a sharing, a gifting or swapping of knowledge. It's not a one way knowledge transition, but it's, it's a back and forth of that reciprocity. Mercedes Dorme's beautiful installations in public art spaces reflect Maha. They invite the viewers to think through land uh, from her very curious arrangements and the stunning beauty that you see in the landscape. The cartographic practices of these California Indians works exemplify communities of care that must be considered when we think through the unmapping of settler terrains. The work of the Indian Collective in Dorme counter a settler commercial map of Los Angeles. Indigenous people relegated by the settler state as expendable and erasable graffiti are working against the capitalist and state ordinances at various scales. Rather than understand this as a subjugated positionality, I posit that graffiti is the critique necessary and valuable to understand in the interlocking structures of oppression. In the following words from uh, Lee Ann Simpson's poem that inspired this work, Quote, erasing Indians is a good idea, of course. The bleeding heart liberals and communists can't, can stop feeling bad for the stealing and raping and murdering, and we all can move on. We can be reconciled, except I am graffiti, except mistakes were made. It is these mistakes, or bad Indians, in the words of uh, Deborah Miranda, that we continue to see ongoing indigenous inscriptions on American landscapes, inscriptions that deny the permeability of settler colonialism and expose the powerful maps of commerce and subjugation. Graffiti is the memories and practices of gendered forms that undo the evidence of our subjugation. They rupture land merely as merely property and can undo the separation of humans and non-human or more than human. Cultural production and everyday acts of uh, uh, resurgence had the force to undo a colonial unknowing defined by Vilmoseri, um, Pegues, and Goldstein as produced and practiced in concert with material acts of violence and differential devaluations that are striving to preclude relational modes of analysis and ways of knowing otherwise. So here, just to unpack this a little bit, I'm talking about the billboards as something that we know that's about commerce, that's about selling, and that preclude other ways of understanding the land around us. There are different devaluation, there's a devaluation of indigenous knowledge within the landscapes of Los Angeles. And this devaluation is supported through the settler structures of federal recognition processes or processes since you're all in Canada. So our art bodies and actions take on a colonial unknowing of setting that which is supposed to count as evidence of disappearing or devalued knowledges. 
Our art, bodies, and actions are embodied sovereignty on the settler landscape meant to erase and eradicate the indigenous forms of relationality. The cartographic art productions I discuss here provide ways of seeing indigenous futurities and relationalities beyond the destruction continuously wrought in the settler terrains, especially those within urban communities. Doris May's work is nestled in a community of care uh, and ancestral polta lands across the urban sprawl that is LA. She literally creates new ways to see the landscape and in doing so is enables, enables us to see our own self-destruction through prominent commercialism. Upon receiving the Indian Collective's Radical Imagination Grant, Romero, who was a longtime Los Angeles resident, thought critically about absences in the LA narrative and landscape. As she states in her artist statement, quote, the imagery evokes the old aim adage, we are still here. But for these images, we must center the Tomvo when we say Los Angeles. Now, for those of you unaware of the where we are still here, there's this large bit of famous graffiti on the island of Alcatraz, which sits in the Bay Area on a lonely land. Um, and that has become an iconographic, uh, iconographic place marker within the Bay Area as well. So um, when we when we think about graffiti, I don't have time to go into that part, which will be added to this uh, chapter later, but um, we can think about what that means when we say we are still here in that space and in that very public setting and in a carceral space. So the first billboard that we see is with Shoyot Alvitre's iconic revisioning of the Hollywood sign to read Tomva Land, which begins the series and is the title of the series itself. Nothing says LA like the Hollywood si sign uh, iconography here. To reclaim the recognizable land and space of Griffith Park in this tongue-in-cheek graphic begins the larger reclaiming we see throughout the series. In Kara Romero's work, Indian Collective, she takes this co-creation and, co and consultation seriously. She spent many days with, with people and going out and visiting important areas. Significant to these cartographic art practices that reclaim space is the history of Los Angeles and dispossession. Even before Tavanger becomes subsumed under the state of California and US federal jurisdiction, its history is intertwined with international claimings of property and burgeoning US property law. In California, Tavangar would be divided up into several Spanish grants and then later post-secularization upon Mexican independence, it would then be divided up into numerous Mexican land grants. The land, these Mexican land grants would act more as title to property as they did not return to the crown, unlike the Spanish land grants when somebody passed away, the title would return to the crown there. So we see the kind of shifting to different forms of property. So land grants could only be passed between European and Christian nations. So I wanna be clear about that too. And this was done without the consent. Consent becomes a big part of thinking through cartographic care, practices of care. So this was done without the consent of those who lived on the land since time immemorial. Settler regimes were then perpetuated with the registering of land claims and the US domestication of California. Again, American Indians did not consent, but title was still passed from the Christian to Christian nation in accordance with the doctrine of discovery. That was uh, post 1832 begins to be used to relegate native people as domestic dependent nations. This race-making and form of dispossession forms the foundation of US Supreme Court law. K. Sue Park reminds us that, quote, while the English word property still retains the meaning of a quality or trait belonging to a thing from its old French derivation, its more dominant use now to signify a thing owned or a possession appears to have been rare before the 17th century. During that century, when the English colonization project came into full bloom, the Anglo adaption of this term made the second usage common. The parameters of things that could be owned under English law expanded dramatically and what it meant to own or possess them underwent a sea of change in the colonies. 
Basically here, Casey Park is talking about slavery in the owning of bodies, but also in the owning and property of uh, making property out of owning land. So the center of US power is property rights, the legal that seeks to legitimate conquest and violence. Mapping is an essential settler tool in these processes, and it's a tool used to domesticate land in Southern California and propel development. The 493 hand-drawn Desenos maps filed with the Public Land Commission in 1852 are all similar to the Bonus Aires ones that you see pictured here. The Land Act of 1851 established the domestic domestication of California landscape under U.S. governments, providing an avenue to legitimate the existing Mexican land grant rights and map out territory that they saw as yet unclaimed. Now, just to remind people, this is during the gold rush era, expanding markets, um, and expansion of markets that were needed to sustain the U.S. as a nation state, which was, um, which was in getting incredibly in debt and impoverished. Even within the history of these maps, the Desenos maps and the land claims processes, the land relationships of California Indians in Southern California were not only denied legally, but the mapping process propelled ongoing violence against their bodily survival. Both violence and mapping ensured California Indian erasure in establishing new and ongoing commerce centers. The scratched out land plots that you see here on the left side, I think it's on your left side, uh, marked by outlines of trees, rock formations and water markers are not the plotted lines of the Cartesian accuracy that supposedly land title, land title becomes property which becomes objective. These colonial maps garner power through military might and brutal dispossession. The attempted removal of California Indians, their knowledge system and their ways of seeing and being with the land is necessary to the mass development across California and its ongoing snowball effect on the environment. These chicken scratch maps are original property maps, continuing dispossession even as the plots have been subdivided again and again since this moment. The Desenos Buenos Aires map that we see here is now the area of Bel Air in UCLA it, in uh, parts of Brentwood and parts of Beverly Hills. It is the homeland, however, always and forever of the Gabrielino Tomva who continued their relationship with the San Gabriel Mountains. Many of these maps depict regions that are the most expensive real estate properties in the United States. Newer maps may exist of these properties, and they um, may exist of these properties, and they may seem more objective or more scientific with better models of scale or more realist representations. And the cartographic practices have become more familiar to us as that kind of colonial uh, unknowing. And they may see, but they at their core of these maps are still, they map dispossession they map the stealing of land. So while the Tomba currently do not have a tribal land base anywhere in Los Angeles or a place to launch their Tiots along the coastal lines, which has some of the highest real estate cost, the people continue to have a deep knowledge of place and a commitment to protecting all their relatives, the human and more than human. So I just wanted to say what the lack of stewardship has also indigenous stewardship across Los Angeles has meant just this summer has been a sewage spill and nuclear, <laughs> nuclear waste and, um, and numerous other kinds of issues that have existed in the water uh, along Tovangar or in those particular territories. So situated in the borders and boundary section of the map and the territory exhibit at the Fowler Museum at UCLA, uh, I didn't mean that's I, not nuclear spell, it was oil spell. It was an oil spell and a sewage spell that happened just this summer. So I wanna make that clear, sorry, re, re going in my head. So situated in the borders and boundary section of the map and the territory exhibit at the Fowler Museum at UCLA, Mercedes Dormes, our land in the sky waking up installation 
acts as a deep map that defies Western concepts of map territory held in colonial encompassing property logics. So this we see on the right hand side of the screen here. By creating connections to land and community that travel through time and the presentation of collected and stored cultural objects that exist at the Fowler Museum, she emphasizes the practice of making ongoing connections to place. The pieces that comprise Mercedes installation were drawn from the archaeological collections, particularly those that were at uh, Playa Vista. And I'll go into a second what Playa Vista is. In consultation with Wendy Teeter, Sedona Goldman, Shelsky, and Mitzla Aguilar, they worked on and went lovingly through the boxes where Tomva items were stored after being disinterred through the violent process of development in that particular area. So while the remains have been returned, not all items fall under NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection Act that was passed in 1990 um, that demands remains given back. And implementation is, law is only as good as is implementation and a lot of universities and institutions have not returned a lot of those items under NAGPRA. At UCLA, we have a 98% return rate of NAGPRA eligible items, but unfortunately, um, many of the items that get disinterred do not necessarily fall under NAGPRA. I can go into more of that in Q&A if you would like. So the items that are not have not been returned rest on the shelf at the museum on UCLA's campus. Dora May thought carefully about the relationship between these items and placed them on the spiral pedestal. Many were from Playa Vista, the development that was to house and help build what is now referred to as Silicon Beach. Uh, Silicon Beach is the new uh, San Francisco, is the, is the new tech, one of the new tech capitals being developed. This commercial area was developed after NAGPRA, but the disinterment could not be stopped as the Gabrielino Tamva, like many whose homelands are in these high real estate zip codes, are not federally recognized. This means that they are unprotected under NAGPRA laws and their lands and uh, cultural materials are highly at risk. This removal from the landscape of ancestral presence of over 400 ancestors did not take place in a far past, but in 2007. They were only recently re in the, to 2018. Dora May places prominent pictures of her family that she took at the protest um, of the development of her ancestral lands. They overlook the spiral, watching and caring for the items we see here that connotes a portal, a technique often used by Dora May to bring and collapse time. Mitten and star stones are mixed with salt from the ocean and and pigments from the mountains symbolized in, in cinnamon that she uses here. We do not have all aspect to the legend on this map that she is creating in this piece, but what is experienced is a pull toward critical thinking about museums, store its storage of cultural items, and the feeling of loss of knowledge and the disrespect caused by mass consumerism and mass development of these industri industries on sacred lands. On the same plane, however, we is a remembrance captured in the photos and care of lovingly placing items and renewing connections in doing so. Dora May engages with traditional cultural items to remap the path back, despite the disinterring of cultural objects that continue to happen as development occurs and institutions are built. As Sandy Grande says, genocide and slavery set the conditions for who was perceived and constructed as legitimate subjects of care. What Dorme does here is rearrange and is very clear that her ancestors and her cultural items uh, deserve to be just as cared for as, uh, as others. So this is kind of, she redefines and remaps an idea of care here that's important. Sorry, one second. So 
Dora May engages with these items to remap that path back, despite the disentering of the objects that continue to happen as development occurs and institutions are built. The physical landscape of her map highlights the unknown through the mysterious cog stones, what she refers to as star stones in a preferred naming of the celestial. And the, known that re and the known that remains and keeps those lines of connections intact, represented in her trademark that we see here of the red strings that flow into and out of the frame of the photos and installations. Salt, skirt, earth, sky, and memory present a powerful presence in creating this installation map of ongoing Tomba presence. This map is a powerful anti-colonial map juxtaposed against the simplicity of the Desenos map on the left. And it asks us to question power and place and reprioritize our relationship to our relationship to where we're at in Los Angeles. So the Sittler architecture of Los Angeles created a landscape of immeasurable environmental destruction, propagated violent and racialized property regimes as well. In Understanding Fair Housing, a report undertaken by the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights in 1973, they report that by 1940, 80% of properties in Los Angeles included a racial restrictive covenants in their deeds, some of which remain on the deeds to this day, if not legal under the law. So many people can find this in their deeds as the, they get passed on. So the need for labor and expansion has always been part and parcel of how race was laid out in Los Angeles. Kelly Lytle Hernandez in her book, City of Inmates, makes clear that the ways that caging worked, a uh, word she uses in her text, enabled the buildup of carceral systems that would be a source of labor. Lytle Hernandez starts with the early foundation with native people who were legislated into criminality and sold at places like La Plaza where they would be forced laborers. Making vagrants through erasure on the landscape was a key way to build a city infrastructure. She also talks about poor whites who migrated to California and uh, when they were arrested and picked up also under vagrancy laws, they would be made to build streets and do street work. Most of Beverly Hills and the streets that got laid down there were built through these vagrancy laws and largely white, uh, white settler vagrants versus Indian laborers who were, um, who were sold off for their fines till their fines are paid to rancherias, et cetera. Young women um, between certain ages, younger ages were actually sold at a higher rate and, um, and under complete uh, authority of these white ranchers. And it was, it, the rate of rape and sexual violence was huge. So the architecture that we see of uh, through the law within Los Angeles and through the buildup of this mass consumerism also has everything to do with sexual violence and the non-consent of Gabrielino Tomba woman in all ways possible with land being sold off and their own bodies being sold off. So the connection between land and bodies at this scale is deep. So while the Desenos and subsequent titles, land leases, racial covenants, and legalities create a thing out of Tavangar, they fail to sever tribal relationships to land. Cara Romero's large-scale project spread out across the landscape of Los Angeles and iconic Los Angeles neighborhoods, enables the viewer to make the scaled connections between erasing Tomfa bodies, effacing tribal practices, eliminating the tribal structures and obliterating the original landscape and that of mass consumerism. Romero states on her artist profile that, quote, the images in this collection of work made in Los Angeles by both Tomva artists and myself are a live in dialogue between California Indians, urban Indian transplants, settlers, and diasporic peoples. Indigenous forms of graffiti, and indeed our very bodies, are anti colonial tools crafting new cartographies in the wake of mass development. Graffiti is denying settler permanence. Indigenous graffiti is not just about marking territory, but also about creating relationality. 
So I just wanted to point at this redlining map that was done in 1939, and we can see the various levels of area that were seen to be good to live in, and those seem more risky to live in. And those are marked by racialized practices, and we can see the green areas being the best areas, and that's Beverly Hills, et cetera, and Homby Hills, and where the Desenos map is, and those that become more in threat, such as um, in South Los Angeles, Southeast Los Angeles. So I wanted to point that out uh, because it matters to where, uh, where Cara Romero uh, decided to put up the billboards, which we've seen marked here throughout very iconic places in Los Angeles. Near, we see uh, one of the billboards near Dodger Stadium and West Hollywood and uh, on the Miracle Mile, which is on a very, the Wilshire Corridor Boulevard and other places. So this is important. Romero uses the genre of the billboards so often overlooked for their mass population across the cityscape and familiarity to jar the passerby into awareness. Kolashaw argues that Aboriginal acts of uh, social dis disruption here, this is a piece from Australia, rather than being understood as, as a uh, pitiable actions of a people without a capacity for agency or, or those that are seen as criminal and doing an unlawful act, they should be read instead as radical acts of refusal to accept the liberal promises of the settler state. To better understand the relationship between gendered violence and settlement, we must then begin to connect that scale and body. As I talk about elsewhere uh, in, in various pieces, to that of the quotidian capitalist practices held up by the infrastructure of state capitalism itself. Indigenous bodies, Tomvo bodies, objects and cultural items are prominently featured, not as a point of commercialism that one might see in a certain perfume ad, say, starring Johnny Depp, but in full regalia and sublime tones. Here's two of the billboards that we see. I put one in there, you can see where it's placed and you can see an up close image of this through Cara Romero's work. This is called Mitza at Pavanga, where she is juxtaposed in full regalia with a set of sunglasses ever casually resting on her traditional basket hat at the site of Tamva in a Hachiman emergence with a large airplane flying over. Romero and the Indian Collective are not returning us to the nostalgic past that frankly is unattainable due to the destruction colonization has wrought but rather claiming the still sacred space of creation in Pavangna, its ongoing relationality within that place. Mitzla is a touchstone. She is present and past folding into the future. The billboards and this one in particular are mapping a road to caring for a place that despite a noise and reverberation of mass consumerism, these images tear back the gritty streets of LA to expose the beauty that is Tovangar. I turn to discuss the two other billboards in the series that are similar in palette to the Mitzla at Pavangna above, which also named the, Tom, named the Tomva woman while placing them. Here, the method that is being taken up by both scholars and or activists alike is that of rematriation is key to an analysis of practicing cartographic uh, art, art practices of care here. As Rematriation Magazine founder, Michelle Shenandoah, who's Haudenosaunee states, rematriation is not just about changing ownership, but it is a return to the sacred. Now here, Stephen Newcomb's work, who used this term in night, as early as 1995 to talk about a more holistic approach to repatriation, defined uh, rematriation as a return to a living culture, a turn, returning a living culture to earth. Indigenous practices were all part of this creating of wellness in communities. As Newcomb emphasizes, quote, as a concept, rematriation acknowledges that our ancestors lived in a spiritual relationship with our lands for thousands of years, that and that we have a sacred duty to maintain that relationship for the benefit of our future generations. So relationship between land and us is key to creating a wellness and a return of land practice. 
The practices of survival depicted in the billboard are the key to practices of rematriation. From the Washoyo uh, billboard that we see on the, on the left, she is holding the basket close and lovingly, adapting to technology that we, such as what we see in the Mitzla at Pavanga frame, to plunging into sacred waters for renewal, to relishing our remnants from our ancestors, or returning to the sea that still remains. Each of the Tomva women stand prominently in the monochromatic frame floating in trees or waters. Uh, and the picture on the right, Mercedes at Caravanga, at Caravanga um, we see that she is splayed in a cross configuration floating freely in the freshwater springs at Caravanga, a village site of the Tomva. When I first laughed, I, when I first saw this image, I laughed as outside the frame and above her is a majestic tree planted by the Spanish to mark fresh water sites. This tree is provi provided the evidence of the Portola expedition and thus enabled the Dorames, Lassos, and Angie Barnes to register the site as an historic place. They then formed a 501c3 that protects the place to this day as a foundation, and it is currently under control of Indigenous stewardship by Bob Romeris and has been a site of great Tomva connection on the west side of Los Angeles. It's one of the only un, um, undeveloped places that is under Tomva control across Los Angeles landscape. So to see Mercedes relaxing and chilling in the pools underneath that tree and, and in those waters that pump massive amounts of fresh water daily um, is, is, really quite, is really quite a sight to see. And if anybody has any more questions, I can talk about that place too in Q and A. Um, Currently, however, Caravanga has a lease with LAUSD that is consistently threatened by development from such entities or liberal entities as we see as the YMCA, who uh, in recent years sought to pave over, uh, pave over part of the Caravanga Springs for a parking lot. However, Angie Barron's had the foresight and the temporality of most elders, since the temporality of most elders, to plant oak trees which could not be taken down once over a certain height because of the oak tree blight. So they were protected by those laws. These are the ways that, that they're constantly negotiating settler law and trying to make it work to uh, stop development and the disinterring of their peoples. So um, they were not able to tear up the oak tree in the medicine garden for this new facility in the far corner of the University High School campus. However, their lease is only um, renewed yearly and um, that is also an issue. So Mercedes clear presence and relaxation in this spot is so meaningful in understanding rematriation as an embodied sovereignty or embodied practice where the connection with the water is key. Washoyot in a similar vein presents elegance, peace and a floating airiness as she rests over the assemblage of commercial LA. Given the history of non-consent in all its forms, from indigenous women's bodies to the exploitation and taking of land, the acts of Mitzla, Washoyot, and Mercedes to so boldly place themselves overlooking large swaths of LA is courageous. We quote, um, we accept being made invisible as a kind of Novocaine rather than endure the constant grinding of historical traumas that directly targeted Native women's bodies and our ability to express ourselves in language and literacy, says Deborah Miranda when speaking to a tactic of how to cope with the violence enacted on California Indian women. The refusal for th these three women who are named in these billboards to be unseen explodes across the public sphere and demands to be listened to. Romero and the artist pictured in her photography of Los Angeles lay claim to land and, our re and their relationship to it in the form of street art that is so public and so moving. Turning land into property through creating it as a commodity and severing the deep relationships of the people allowed for its desecration. Mass commercialization of Tavangar was followed by toxins polluting the land, water diverted under cement, and the ongoing commercialization of the landscape that is harmful, not just to First Peoples. 
River Garza's billboard, a collage of images and graffiti inscriptions, reflects the harm of mass consumerism. The disjointed images and collage of commercial prints with writing comments to the art of graffiti are, are, are presented in big, big billboard. Uh, street art practices signify Garza's form, and here he questions commercialism and his bricolage of images that have created assimilation of the Indian, to employ Gerald Bisner's coinage, that is the absence, quote, of the tribal real. That is, River examines the Buffalo Nickel, the Cleveland Braves, the Washington Ardward, tobacco companies, alongside what are often deemed American values, such as blind justice. Through imagery play here, he points out the hypocrisy of manifest destiny through a rudimentary um, Cupid angel with pointed arrows that draw attention to the written words. Here, manifest destiny. This of course is to reflect the famous John Gast manifest destiny painting of American progress in, from 1872. Yet Los Angeles is also the city of angels, is also facetiously presented as a city of love by juxtaposing the angel next to high polluting oil wells, which are all over LA and found particularly in poor black and brown communities. America as a land of justice is highlighted as anything but, as we see in the revolutionary figure also of Toporina, the image um, of Lady Justice. She is masked with outstretched arms of basket of acorns, not the scales. Toporina led a rebellion against the Spanish colonizers and paid dearly for the act. Um, her many of her family was killed, many people died, um, but ultimately she was married off without her consent to a Spanish soldier. The written graffiti screams on the billboard, demanding to undo a romanticized narrative mapping and unmask as Toporina does in the billboard, where we see a darker version of her and the play of the dark and light here is significant. Um, we see the darker version of her with the bed of acorns outstretched as well. <clears throat> This billboard insists, particularly that juxtaposition, that we understand that, quote, if the land isn't healthy, we aren't healthy, as he writes across the, the board. If the land is compromised, we are all compromised. Bringing together the collage, Garza makes a quick note next to the acorn basket. And we see this down here underneath. Note, the wealth of the community is gauged by the health of the land. The roadmap is clear in the genre of the billboard. Refocus, rematriate, and rethink the commercial relationships we have with land in the urban landscape. As Tomfa archaeologist Desiree Martinez and her co-partner Wendy Teeter remind those who conduct research into Vongar, quote, an inherent practice within Southern California Native American communities is reciprocity. In the past, reciprocity usually took the form of goods or foods given to those in need, knowing that they would be returned to the provider at some future date. Reciprocity not only solidified cultural and social ties, but also ensured cultural and physical survival during times of stress, environmental or otherwise. Community members who had access to the most resources usually gave the most. Acorns as a staple of California Indian, particularly those in Southern California and of the Chumash are significant. Um, the Chumash, Tomba, Hachiman in this area. If your lands are developed and your acorn trees destroyed and your gathering sites um, under no longer there and under concrete, what does that mean? But here we see reciprocity reciprocity in the making of landscapes which advocate for the health of land and thus is key to mapping communities of care. What might mapping justice look like if we carefully thought through what measures our relationship to land? How might rethinking a landscape beyond capital change our relationships to each other? Garza's image is not a whimsical a common trait of street art, but rather a complex presentation that unravels a generic Plains Indian landscape, something that's just taking from and appropriating Indians. Instead, he turns that 
Not only does he question the commercialism of such an image, he's very specific in weaving in Tamva rock and sand painting images across the way. These symbols and forms of art are tied to the earth through story, practice, and imagining the millenni millennial intergenerational passing down of knowledges. Rock art, in fact, shares in its inscription on hard surfaces, similar qualities as the graffiti form that Garza's image takes. It is the earliest form of visualization that often looks at relational modes of being of early humans while also asserting a presence and a refusal of erasure. I am here to go back to the old Ain ad adage. The visual aesthetics of hands or depictions of the cosmos or even a story and pictograph provides this early evidence of what it means to be human, to feel, to desire, to be in relationship with each other. Dorme also in her artwork continually addresses this ancestral loss through the violence of colonization and the ongoing settler infrastructure that enable mass development into Gongar. Dorme was taught to be a cultural resource manager by her father, Robert Dorme, and family who have fought relentlessly against the powerful development companies in Los Angeles. Here I return to Dorme to address her piece called Pulling Back the Sun, a move that illuminates seasonal changes in the equinox and is accompanied as a story of relationality. Dorme tells us this is a quote, cosmology of possibilities. It has three elements of the Tamva community structures that are intertwining the traditional ki, the home, shievo, the healing space, and yovar, the ceremonial space. And the red strings that mark places in the loose pieces of tarps, we see the ongoing struggle, but most importantly, a determination to maintain and imagine a landscape for future Tamva generations. Now here we see an altar in the middle that is placed. And in that altar, um, there were there just beautiful elements that, that, it, that are composed that also are similar to Tamva rock and, and sand painting art. This piece itself is in the State Historic Park, which sits out from underneath um, up in this area is Chinatown. This is in the middle of Los Angeles. It was an old train yardage. Grand Union Station is over this way. Um, what happened is indigenous people across Los Angeles from Latin American indigenous communities, American Indian diasporic communities, and the Tomva all came together to reclaim and plant gardens. And, they, and as a Haudenosaunee woman, I love this part, they planted corn to release the toxins that the train yard had caused from the, uh, caused in the soil. Um, unfortunately, the state eventually took over the state historic park after the toxins had been cleared by indigenous peoples. And then they, pre they presented a, a new park and they used native plants. Um, but Dorme's piece is one of those really prominent pieces that now exists there for a limited time only. So we can talk also about what that means and how uh, rec reclaiming of public spaces and how it operates and gets subsumed under these commercialisms as well. So I, I wanted to really situate this piece in place. So when I visited people and I visited this site at the opening, people were placing their own offerings on the round platform, painted in a similar style as those ceremonial sand paintings I referred to earlier. The wind wafted through the park and one could feel the breeze with a hint of ocean salt through the holes left through the batik canvases. Um, reminding me of the rock art and sunburst paintings in such important places as the Torca Cave on Pimu, or what, what many know as Catalina Island. The piece creates a wonder and a point to reflect on the senses. It is also a place of shelter and contemplation. As I watched people place offerings in silence without an explanation on the altar, from acorns to miniature dodger balls, it became clear how important it was for strangers to make place and connections. So while it is too often the indigenous who are relegated to loss or the lost, it became clear that the lack of connection to place ultimately affects all. Um, Dorme's piece not only offers that reflection, but a place to uh, process communities of care. It is at once on an individual scale while simultaneously overlapping with the past, present and emerging communities of care that we see in Los Angeles. 
As Dorme relays in the artist statement, quote, in Tomva beliefs, the winter solstice is not about focusing on being the shortest day of the year, but rather on the phenomenon that on this day, we pull the sun back into the sky, signaling the beginning of more light. This lens creates a space of positive potentialities and acknowledges the original caretakers of Los Angeles, the Tomfa people, towards envisioning a more equitable future. So as the California Indian artists reflect here, mapping communities of care in the Los Angeles basin do not just begin with relating to a past or, or mapping a past, but beginning to imagine new landscapes from that which remains. As the precious items are returned and land rematriated, communities of reciprocity, relationality, I was reminded through this particular art piece of the words of Deborah Miranda once again, quote, we think we are too broken to ever be whole again, but it's not true. We can be whole just differently. So to get to this point of wholeness or wellness that's promoted in Garza's paint, uh, billboard, we must begin to undo the afterlife of covenant codes spoken of earlier. We must map a new way to relate to land outside of plundering and respect water that we cannot live without in Los Angeles. We must continue to make public spaces that undo the visual terrains of destructions. So thank you all <laughs> very much. I'll stop my sharing. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, for that wonderful lecture and uh, for joining us today. Uh, I'll pass it over to Elaine because I know she always has burning questions and uh, I, I've been writing down uh, tentatively a, a ton of notes. Uh, also shout out to uh, my students who are here and will be uh, reflecting on this as a part of their critical evaluation uh, that that will be due a little bit later today. So uh, Elaine, over to you first. Yeah, just thank you for the wonderful wide ranging nature of your talk, which just showed all of your kind of scholarly capacity to make us think um, maybe in very obvious ways, uh, uh, kind of new and old ways of, of place. And as you say, bringing past into the present. And also, of course, it has such an interesting um, T temporal dimension as well. So thanks for bringing both of those together and, and particularly your use of artists to um, help us understand the kind of the ongoing presence, uh, ongoing indigenous presence in, on lands where this has been, as you, uh, you know, so eloquently described, uh, erased, not in any kind of benign way, but really enforceable ways through law, through property, through quote unquote public spaces, through militarization, through sexual violence and so on. So thanks just for the incredible wide ranging um, erudition of your talk that brings alive so many different aspects of what it means to be on Indigenous lands, you know, in, 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 the, in, 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 in the moment that we're in. So I guess the one question I would have is all of your work has been interested in um, the visual. And, and because of that, you've drawn very much on the kind of innovative artists that we saw today. And I wondered if you could, you, you'd mentioned a little bit earlier that you had noted that it, uh, artists are often ahead of us. And I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about, about that, like your uptake of artists and your attempt to kind of share and interpret their vision in ways that can be taken up within, within the academy, which I find, you know, so enriching. Yeah. Well. I always think of uh, uh, Helena Maria Veramontes' work, who's a, a Chicana scholar um, that I read years ago in, in one of the early feminist anthologies that they had. And it's called, uh, she made this piece called The Making of Nopolitas. And I think it's the actual making and praxis of something or having to create something new or constantly working with your hands maybe or, or, or something like that. So, I mean, there's cerebralness that goes along with that, of course. But um, it's like when you write something for all the grad students out there, you just have to sit down and write it sometimes. And I tell my students that they're like, ah, the, the, you know, they think they have to have the plan and the thesis and everything all done. It's great to have that done too, trust me. But sometimes if you just sit to write, then, then things become clear to you, right? It becomes clear as, as, as you do it. But I think artist practice is similar to that, especially those that take up kind of multiple forms. The painting behind me that you see in my background, that's River Garza's work as well. And this, this piece is on at Indian Alley or Winston Street Alley as some people prefer to be called, which was a site of relocation 
uh, for for American Indians in the 1950s. It was a, uh, a place of care site, actually. It was a place of care. So um, I, I, see, I see river mapping the village sites of Tavangar as an important also modes of, of the, those cares, those sites, that inscriptions that happen. Um, and I see the actual kind of way where they make us think differently um, so sometimes some of the counter maps you see of native land and some of the larger native land projects can't always capture some of the some of the more nuanced relationships to land right they're mapping out territories sometimes and often still a western traditional cartesian ways it's kind of a flat map or a thin um a thin map versus a thick map which carries those stories with them or a thick map which can hold at the same time, hold uh, the fact that uh, some places are meeting places, right? The, all across the United States, I was just talking about this yesterday during um, my, my lecture on the reservation era. I teach the reservation era as creating geopolitical spaces across the US. So when you see that, um, when when you see that you look at those cities a lot of them were trading centers and shared centers with with different sets of responsibility that go with that so i feel like the artists have the ability maybe in the materials they use or in the different ways to offset us to think about place in a different way so i, I see them taking something that might be common like you can tell this is a map behind me but it's not accurate right there there's certain things that that river does that makes it really beautiful there's certain things that he makes it readable but you have to stop and think about the map itself right and um and i i think really kind of highlighting and exposing what we should be thinking about is resetting those priorities resetting uh relaying what's important going forward as well so that's i that's that's my answer i guess to that <laughs> i hope that made sense it, it made it made absolute sense. It's kind of <laughs> artistic urgency, but also a, a political urgency, right? That comes mm -hmm. through in these. I also think that the it was so interesting how, in a way, uh, uh, you repurposed that map from the 1930s, uh, the one about redlining. And a poet has to write a poem about redlining someday, in which in which you know that wasn't intended, I suppose when it was written as a map of colonial violence and then that gets reincorporated actually into your own work as a as it was a, meant as a real estate guide <laughs> right right yeah but and but it stands in now for something very different right you can have a totally other reading than than was ever intended in the 1930s so actually your own repurposing of that work was interesting to me so <laughs> you have an art uh you have an art career on the side i think and um, I'll, I'll 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 send it, it never turns out as i imagine it in my head like i like <laughs> telling students what to do with like things i imagine in my head and then they do it more beautifully so <laughs> There, there is a there is a question um, from Susie Yang and 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 she writes the following. Uh, when I visited Hong Kong, I took alternative tours and I learned so much about the egregious enactments of erasure performed by the famous buildings of the skyline, as well as the disappearing acts of neighborhood renewals. And she asks, is there something similar um, in in uh, what we now well what colonialists call L.A. or California? So we've joked about this. So um, <laughs> there was this tour done by this comedian um, and uh, Cindy Alvitre, who's head of the Tiat Society. I, I, I never got to experience this and I'm, I'm really sad about it. But I guess at one point they did a tour where they would like take people to let's hunt and gar harvest and they take them to Whole Foods and have them go in there with the dollar. Um, so <laughs> there, there, there's been some talk about it, but sometimes some of these tours are also seen as exploitive, like uh, eco-tourist tours. There's a lot of literature on this actually. Um, so there are tours, there's an environmental tour that people do to talk about all the environmental destruction sites across Los Angeles. Like Watts is, uh, you know, the the companies when they're making tires and, and that kind of stuff, all the toxins were underneath that. And of course, that's where they relocate black people. That's one of the signs where that's one of the places where black people could live because they were living in toxins, right? Um, 
So there becomes these tours, but the question is what happens after, right? Like, uh, the, like touring poverty or touring that is also can be questionable sometimes. So yes, there are tours. Do I recommend them all the time? I don't know. I've, I've just seen some controversy. I think having knowledge of them is, is good. Um, there's a wonderful map of all the oil sites that's done. I think it's done out of Pomona. Um, I was on a panel once with this environmental scientist who was examining all the oil wells and where they were positioned across Los Angeles. And some of it was, was really scary. Like the oil refineries, they hide them behind these large trees in Angeles. But when you do an aerial site, you see that a kid's bedroom will be right next to the oil refinery, right? So I think there's a particular way, rents are so high in Los Angeles that many of uh, many workers and, and um, laborers that don't make as much money live in these poorer areas where this is also taking pl place, the oil refinery. So um, I think there's maps. There's mapping Indigenous LA, which we love, uh, which is a, a digital project that I'm part of where you can go and you can look and, and see where to visit and think historically where things are at on the map there too. Um, so yeah, the, that's kind of a long answer to that question. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's it's helpful to pull out the contradictions, I think. Um, Sean has yeah. shared actually uh, one of these sites. I've got a kid wandering in the background. I hope it doesn't disturb anyone, but that's that's the reality of living with Zoom, right? I have three kids and they sometimes show up. I'll hand it over to uh, Sean uh, so I don't monopolize all of your time and energy. Yeah, I just dropped in the mapping uh, Indigenous LA uh, into the chat for everybody if they want to uh, to check that out. Um, so I, I very much enjoyed this talk uh, in in the again the the number and breadth and depth of kind of topics and issues that this touches on and really kind of discussing art as a form of political action, conversation and activism. Uh, I'm a huge um, art collector and uh, yeah, as you see pieces behind me, but like tons of others and like I'm so I have stuff in storage of people like you need to stop buying art. Um, and with that, oh, uh, I'm, I'm not an artist, right? I like can't even do. Well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I can't even do stick figures, so I'm not going to go there. Uh, I was really interested in a number of pieces. I have no, like, I have random thoughts everywhere. Uh, one was really around graffiti and the role of graffiti, and I know that you're going to touch on that uh, in a different kind of talk, but I found that to be interesting and immediately where my thoughts started to go. Um, but really what I was interested in was really when you said, if the land isn't health, we aren't health. Uh, um, you know, if the land is compromised and we are compromised, the health of the community is tied to the health of the land, which is so foundational to the work and the research that I particularly do as a One Health scholar trying to re engage our understanding of human health is directly connected to the health of our land, of our built environment, the, de the destruction and the displacement and the artificial boundaries that, that are put up there. I'm just interested if you want to talk a little bit more, there's a ton of uh, health students uh, on the call right now. And they were, some had posed the question of like, oh, I don't necessarily see the connection of where this talk is going to talk about health. And I said, just wait, it'll be there. And and it, it certainly came out in many facets. And so oh, that's what God, I was interested I in. That is <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, my question isn't really a question, it's more of a statement just around if you have any additional thoughts on kind of where some of your work really kind of takes you in, in this kind of foundational understanding of land and its connection to health and to the peoples that you work with. Okay. So I guess I would think about it in relation to River Garza's work, right? Primarily, that's where the health came up. But people might, here, I'm going to just share it again so we can go back and talk about it. But in Rivers' work here, um, I think what he's trying to do is trying to get out of, he's trying to do a place, I, I'm not gonna speak for what he's, what I see this piece doing is um, really trying to create a place-based idea of who the Tomva are. It's, it's particularly place-based. We have acorns, which are high in protein, high healthy, low fat, you know, um, and it's incredibly hard to, to work them out. And um, 
I, they just figure so prominently here as we see in the bowls that are being put forth in in and here by obviously this is a reference to blind justice that there's no justice here this here where it says navy this is saint nicholas island where they pr perform a lot of defense training and bombing and things like that that's destroyed the ecosystem there so that is incredibly sensitive place as well in terms of militarization which is not healthy for the island it's not healthy for the the fish or or any of those people there as well and this is Catalina as well, where we have mass tourism on Catalina Island. So the way that I see him working, working this out with all the different ways, the generic Indians, if you're only always thinking of Indians in this pan and indigenous plains way, then you don't have to address the real concerns of that place and the health of that place. And so what I see him trying to do is get past the glitz and glam of what a plains Indian is to get to place and get to what makes that particular place healthy. And what makes that particular place or Los Angeles healthy is uncementing the waters, right? They're cemented for the sake of development because um, some of the, uh, for instance, at UCLA, there's a creek, uh, an ephemeral creek that runs through there in different, in different seasons. Um, that was cemented under in a lot a lot of the parts of, of UCLA because there's no room. The campus needed to build. And so they did it for the sake of building and development. And what do you, the UCs, I know I'm get, I get paid by the UC system. So I may be a hypocrite here. But what uh, the UCs did was they built up California. Like they, that's what they're meant to do is to, you know, have agriculture and um, create create uh, parts of an educated populace to begin to develop Los Angeles and it worked. So um, I, I think what we see here is him really trying to get, trying to get at, you know, uh, what it means to be Tomva outside of these generic and often insulting um, images that we see here as well. And I think that's why you have Toparina so prominent in, in here as well. And the health, I mean, spirit, obviously, maybe a lot of you are in Canada. I don't know, do you have spirit cigarettes in Canada? No, it's uh, Native Americans. It's not Native American. It's like they're called spirit cigarettes and they kind of steal a lot of the iconography from Native people. I don't think they're Native owned. But anyway, cigarettes. And we all know cigarettes aren't good for you, so... I'm not dispelling anything there, but there's also a particular way this brand is seen as good, better for you than Marlboro or better for you than Camel, right? So there's a particular way that that spirit cigarettes, him playing with that image becomes important there as well. So I don't know if that 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 works it out. I, I actually think it's about to create healthy places. We have to know what place. We have to get past the generics aspect of what it means to be Indian. Yeah, and I think that that's such a critical kind of piece piece to this. I know another question just came in um, from Ellie. Uh, one of the things I love about the nativeland.ca maps is how the edges uh, overlap and blur. So they show the inevitability of communication and relationship over time. Um, you spoke of maps as an essential settler tool. What are some of the ways that maps can help to decolonize space? Do all maps you just, uh, do all the maps you uh, discuss do that? Um, I think my maps are more anti-colonial in nature and I see anti-colonial as a praxis in that space can't be decolonized until it's returned in many ways. It's still, you know, even the 501c3 space of Caravanga Springs Foundation, they still have to, they still have to deal with leases and property leases, right? Part of the colonization should be self-determination of spaces also. Um, I'm not one to, I lean always more towards anti-colonial, call it my Haudenosaunee self, I don't know, but I, I lean towards that kind of constantly being aware that we must perform a praxis and we can't just declare something de decolonial. And until that, that is returned, land is returned and 
not just returned under kind of an ownership model, but returned in a way in which people can have self-determination within those spaces, then maybe we can begin to talk about decolonial. So um, I see them as anti-colonial maps though, that fighting against the ongoing uh, possessions in certain ways of these maps. So uh, that is what I would say, the, na the native land maps, it's very controversial in California, actually. It's not so easy. I think it's, you know, at one point, and I know it's been a development in progress and now that they, they now have an advisory board from all over, but in the early practices, some of the Haudenosaunee stuff wasn't accurate, but it is now. Um, and they have more, they have more of an advisory board, but California is a complex landscape, um, partly because of how the mission systems and it has a, a very different history in some ways than, than others. E each state has its own history. I, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I think there's lots of really good attempts there, but I know that there's some kind of back and forth going on in Los Angeles in particular around, um, naming of whose territory they're in but that's probably because some people have want to be called different things like there's i use gabrielino tamba because that's a majority of the different lineages want to use gabrielino tamba so in los angeles so i'll just leave it there i don't i don't <laughs> i don't know i'm not sure you know we can all grow and it, it, it can it, it can grow i i hope but um, there's just some overlapping sites and, you know, um, for those unfamiliar with the California landscape, the missions kind of herded everybody on there from different village sites. Like we had, you can see behind me all the different village sites, but to bring everybody into a, a, a mission and then call them the mission name, that's like calling, that would be like calling black people their, you know, their name of the land. So I think there's like a lot of controversy around there about how, how to go about this. It's a lot of violence that, that happened in California as a genocidal state, so. Uh, there, there's a, one more question and then maybe you can answer that and we'll give you time for a couple of last words about a public space. So you began by talking about um, uh, things that can be owned in the way that this expands under kind of colonial and capitalist relationships. But at, at the end, actually, you weren't talking about kind of private property so much as you were talking about public spaces, parks, and the way that parks are claimed by the colonial state. So uh, maybe just a few words about how Indigenous relationships with the land don't just complicate private kind of commodifications of land, but they also radically complicate ideas of the public actually, or even the commons as some people use. Yeah, I would say that that's true. I see the I see the relationship. So there's all kinds of there's all kinds of projects happening where people are looking at the ways to bring Los Angeles and, and to redo Los Angeles along the creeks and along the river, the LA River. Um, to redo them as recreation sites, as public sites, public spaces, and, and those sorts of uh, places that we see, um, and bring it back to healthiness to undo the, sorry, a mosquito came by, I speak and watch it rained, and it was like, boom. Um, and to bring it back to kind of a nat more natural state, to uncement the waterways, and and to think about the structure in Los Angeles, there's city planning and urban planning along these lines to plant more native trees to, you know, what does it mean with climate change? Um, what does it mean for laborers who use public transportation? But what does it mean for the coastal sea shores um, and kelp production and abalone production? And there's all these sorts of projects that are occurring. Um, sometimes they get labeled decolonial but they get labeled that without even talking to the indigenous people whose lands are on. And I, I really feel like sometimes decolonial can also become that pan indigenous kind of motion as well. Um, 
So in terms of claiming public spaces, what has happened in the past is once this gets restored or once plant knowledge is used from the tribal elders that are local and the traditional ecological knowledges are used, um, yeah, it's beautiful. That, that park is absolutely stunning and beautiful. But what happened was they built all these like multi-million dollar condos all around it. And so who gets access to those public spaces on a daily basis? When I went down to see um, Mercedes uh, piece in the park and had, you know, she had her artist opening, um, you go through the park and people had, it was beautiful. People had beautiful setups out there that clearly, you know, you're not just taking a car full of stuff to the park. They had it next to their condos, right? And these condos are like $5 million penthouses and things like that. So sometimes in our restoration practices and in, in, our, in our push for that, which I believe in, I, you know, I believe in uncementing the LA River and that it needs to be healthier and trash shouldn't be dumped there. But Yona Creek, the same thing. We should return it to a healthy status because it's not just about us. It's also about the birds and the, and the bees and all the, all the environment around, around us, right? Which we have seen a return recently of uh, various uh, bird species and things like that with the, re with the restoration of these waterways. But at the same time, the cost of that is still who has access, like who has, you know, uh, along these places, restoration has meant mass development and mass development for a few and not, not actual access. There's a question of access. But I'm going to just say that and leave that because my my daughter is doing good paper on that to be <laughs> we're not supposed to cross the boundaries of trying to keep up. <laughs> but it is a question of access in these restoration practices. So before something can be called decolonial, I want to know the question of access. I just talked myself to that some simple question. <laughs> Okay, uh, we just like to say, I think, um, because we've come to the end, actually, that we, uh, I think we like to thank everyone for helping us to put this on. So Dr. Andy Schwartz at the Center for Feminist Research, Dr. Tiffany Pollack at the VPRI for making sure that this worked well technically um, and reassuring us on that front, um, to the Center for Indigenous Knowledges and Languages, for the Faculty of Health. Um, of course, that we're glad that the Center for Feminist Research has participated, but most of all, thank you. Thank you so much. I've, uh, I I sent an email to uh, Dr. Um, Shona Goman this morning saying that Sean and I were exchanging emails saying we were so looking forward to this and and honestly uh, you just absolutely lived up to you know everything that we love about your work the, the, the care that you show kind of performatively as a Haudenosaunee woman on Tongva land is I think a useful model for for other um, scholars I love your creativity and um, I love the as I say the way that you bring the arts in that allow us to kind of reimagine important ways the lands that we're on so thank you very much um i would just appreciate so much your work and we encourage everyone you know most of it is available freely through the york university library so um you're welcome to go check it out and i know we look forward to your writing in the future and i'm so excited to see um this in print and and, and your other work thanks so much thank you. thank you so much bye everybody thank you